Um, and it's my great, great pleasure to introduce a very special guest today, um, Banu Sabramanian. She has been trained as a plant evolutionary biologist. And um, even this morning when we talked, she had a very deep interest in everything we do in the lab and all the scientific questions then providing super useful feedback of how we can think about these questions in slightly different way to unleash our creativity. Um, right now, she's a professor of uh, women, gender, and sexuality studies at the department that she's hosting. And she studies everything um, related or a lot of things are related to social and cultural aspects of science, uh, botany, uh, plant biology, experimental biology. Um, uh, she's won a number of prizes and awards, including uh, Michelle Kendrick Prize, Ludwig Fleck Prize, outstanding academic title, and um, she is here to, to uh, give a seminar today. So, thank you. There's no clock in the room, right? What? Probably behind the screen. Ah. But you're right. Do I need to give you five minutes? I think it's a good thing. Okay. So we, we can give you five minutes. No. Or... no. I just want to make sure I define this. So thank you so much, Ksenia, for inviting me. And I'm so delighted um, to be here. What I'm going to do, I suspect, because much of what I talk about uh, before I get to the crux of it, is a field a lot of you probably don't know. So I'm going to do a brief overview of the field of feminist science and technology studies and then move on to um, rethinking plant biology. So I start, want to start with a brief quiz. What are these and do they have a sex and gender? What are these? Plugs. Plugs, yeah. Do they have, do we talk about them in gender or sex terms? Yes. We talk about male and female parts, right? Computer plugs, lock and key. How about this? Similarly, this is a flower. It has different parts, but onto the flower, we have put our imaginations of male and female and sexuality onto the flower. But this is the International Space Station. Does it have a? If you assign them particular names. Sorry? If you assign them particular names. Okay. So I was in the Air and Space Museum, uh, Smithsonian, a few years ago, and they told a story about how um, when, so Russia also has a space station, and the US and Russian astronauts wanted to meet. But in order to meet, they needed to build a bridge that connected the two. And neither the US nor Russia wanted to be female. <laughs> right? So they had to build a contraption which had a male at both ends. <laughs> a first homosexual union. <laughs> but the reason I tell you the story is that, you know, for most of us, we just think about sex as gender as ubiquitous, is everywhere. We just use these terminology, oh, give me the male part. But it matters. Right? Sex and gender matters, whether you're male and female matters, because along with those terms is a whole history of what we mean by male and female, what we mean by masculinity and femininity, and with it comes questions of power. No one wants to be female, right? And so I, I want to um, move us beyond words to understand that words have histories and meanings, and they matter. So even in biology, when we use these terms, we are using these terms with those histories. And when people listen to us, they listen to us with those histories. So, so very broadly, in most fields, academia is divided into the humanities, the social sciences, and the natural sciences. And in part, what characterizes each of these three is one, the object of study, right? The natural sciences study you know, chemistry, plants, um, and so on, the so-called natural world. The social sciences study the social world, and the human humanities study products 
sort of culture products of the social world. So they distinguish by the object of knowledge and secondly, by methods. The methods we use in the natural sciences where we claim we are objective, right? Somehow we walk in the door and miraculously put all our cultural biases beyond, you know, behind us to be objective about what we study versus the humanities, which is seen as much more subjective. And there's all kinds of value judgments, right? So even within the natural sciences, we talk about the hard sciences and the soft sciences. So that gendered vocabulary and those questions of what is, um, what value we give them, what is hard, what is easy, what is trustworthy, what is not, is caught up in those gendered hierarchies of um, information. And we can talk a bit later of how rigorous the hard sciences are. But in academia, these gendered understandings of field, you know, um, come with them. So very broadly, the field I'm in, would argue that nature and culture, science and society, which we see as binary opposites, are really not binary opposites. They are constantly connected to each other as theories move between nature and culture, culture and nature, science and society, society and nature. And I'll give you some examples as we go on. So categories like race or gender or sexuality, what we mean by native and alien, I would argue, are not self-evident categories. They're categories we have put meaning to, and these meanings have shifted. So if you take a category like race, it's not a stable category. So even if you look in the history of the US, some groups that were not white became white, right? So there's a wonderful book of how the Irish became white, right? So these are um, historical processes as ideas move between science and society. So again, we think of these categories as biologically stable, but if we read a little history, we understand that these um, ideas move over time. So now to think about colonialism, which is really at the heart of what I want to talk about today. Um, the question is, what did colonialism do when we are thinking about the plant world? And I love this quote by Leanne Simpson, who argues, really what the colonizers have always been trying to figure out is, how do you extract natural resources from the land when the peoples whose territory you're on believe that those plant, animal, and minerals have both spirit and agency? And she answers threefold. First, you use gender violence to remove indigenous peoples and their descendants from their land. Second, she argues, you remove agency from plant and animal worlds. So, um, so the many uh, native communities um, for their natural worlds are animated. Right? So part of what science does is we take that out and we talk about it. These are things, these are commodities now we can buy and experiment on and sell. And third, um, you reposition the land as natural resources. And really fundamentally, uh, what colonialism was, was, was extracting, um, extracting natural resources. The country I come from, India, spices were big. So the colonists came to India largely, you know, for the spices. Um, and there's a wonderful book by Amitabh Ghosh recently called The Nutmeg's Curse. And part of what he argues is these spices, these natural resources were actually curses, not a blessing because of those rich resources. Um, that's what, you know, in part brings in colonialism. So I want to talk briefly about um, different geoma, different stories of how we come to science, and some of you might um, share it. So um, growing up in India, the, um, as a child, you're really told stories of these two great epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And in these stories, plant worlds, animal worlds, human worlds mingle with each other. We have gods who are part animal, you know, they're hybrids, part animal, part human. Um, so it's really a very rich world where these kinds of divisions between plant, animal, mineral, that and human that we have in Western science were ones that did not exist, right? And um, plant worlds were very central to the home. So one is, of course, you is is about food, but also foods have you know various kinds of digestive medicinal properties. So there was constantly circulating stories of, oh, you have a stomach ache, you know, you know, eat, uh, boil up some fennel, you have all allergies, boil up some cumin, right? Or ginger is good for digestion. Similarly, a lot of musical instruments which use plants. 
So it really was a world, I would say, where um, um, plant, human, and animal was intermingled, at least in my um, childhood imagination. And there's a wonderful Antiguan author, Jamaica Kincaid. I don't know how many of you know her yet. Um, and who has a wonderful um, story, uh, which was similar to mine, but she's very eloquent, so I'm going to quote her, about growing up in, uh, you know, in a, one of the British colonies and having to learn, you know, British style education. And so she talks about having to learn daffodils, this poem. And she says, in my child's mind's eye, the poem and its contents, though not its author, and the people through whom it came were repulsive. They had no rational or just way of arranging and separating the people who created the things to memorize from the people who made me memorize wonderful things, whether they were about daffodils, heaven and hell, or just the river Thames. And so part of that, uh, the education in, in India also, I went to English medium schools, which was a very British style of education, was all about you know, daffodils, about snow, about um, the albatross, right? About creeper strawberries, creatures, fruits, and plants that I had never encountered in my life. And, you know, so she talks about how you're forced to write, um, you know, that she's out here in, you know, beautiful weather by the beach, and then the exam is about imagining a long wintry night and writing your essay on that. So really that, that so much of post-colonial education was an education of alienation. Um, and so she, the character in her novel, Lucy, a character finally sees a sea of daffodils. And she says, I wanted to kill them. I wish I had an enormous scythe. I would walk down the path, dragging it along and, alongside me. And I would cut those flowers down at the place where they emerge from the ground. It's a very violent scene. But part of it is sort of expressing the product of a post-colonial education, a British style education, where everything you study isn't connected to the world around you, right? But about, um, about the colonists, about colonial worlds, but about colonial education. And for me, botany was much the same, that I had local names I knew of plants with, um, and, um, and often those local names are very descriptive of how they look or what you use them for. And then you come to school and you have to learn everything in Latin. That again, to me, botany was a study in alienation are having to unlearn the words I knew and then um, learn them anew in botany. And as Kincaid says, this naming of things is so crucial to possession, a spiritual padlock with the key thrown irretrievably away that it is a murder and erasing. And all, as all of you know in plant biology, part of what happened is when colonists went um, across the world, they encountered new plants they didn't know. And using the Linnaean system, they created vocabularies. And very often those names were Latin names, often about the white colonizers, right? So Linnaeus has his names, or someone like um, Rhodes, Cecile Rhodes, that the Rhodes Must Fall um, campaign over last summer that started in South Africa has 126 plant species named after him. And one of the question is, we have toppling Rhodes statues, Countries are no longer named after roads. Roads' names were taken off buildings, but we have 126 species of plants still named after roads and so many others of other colonists. So what does it mean as botanists um, with that legacy? What do we do with that? And part of what Kincaid is arguing is that this legacy of capturing and renaming plants leaves the post-colonial writer in the position of having to renegotiate the terms of taxonomy in the tired old language of uh, empire. And so we are all, all stuck with Latin. We are all stuck with those histories of colonial languages and the ways in which we practice botany. Uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who many of you might have read, um, similarly talks um, within the United States. In moving from a childhood in the woods to the university, I had unknowingly shifted between worldviews from a natural history of experience in which I knew plants as teachers and companions to whom I was linked with mutual responsibility into the realm of science. The question scientists raised were not who are you, but what is it? No one asked plants, what can you tell us? The primary question was, how does it work? The botany I was taught was reductionist, mechanistic, and strictly objective. 
Plants were reduced to objects. They were not subjects. The way botany was conceived and taught didn't seem to leave much room for a person who thought the way I did. The only way I could make sense of it was to conclude that the things I had always believed about plants must not be true after all. Again, we see that, um, you know, that education and alienation, where you have to give up uh, a worldview you might have grown up with and then, you know, embrace the botanical view. Um, I will just skip this for a moment, but I'm happy to talk more about how all these ideas function in the culture of science, but I'll leave that for Q&A. Q &A. So a very brief uh, introduction to this field, feminist science and technology study. And really at the heart of it is this argument that very often within at least the science that I was taught, culture is outside of science, right? That somehow when we go into the hallways of science, we can put culture behind us. But the argument is that scientists are humans who grow up in particular cultures, particular historical contexts, right? And they bring those contexts with them. And so rather than picture A, we need to see science as B, where um, science is within culture. And so one of the things we should all be doing is to think about where is my language coming from? Why, am I, why do I believe this? And sometimes it may turn out there are good reasons for it, but very often it turns out it is some accidental history, you know, that has produced this. And that can open up, I think, new ideas um, of how we might do science and how we might understand plant worlds. And so again, going back to this, the circulation of ideas and theories from nature and culture and culture and nature. And uh, Bruno Latour has this very, uh, I think it summarizes it well, is that part of what we have done in academia is what he calls work of purification, where we have purified it. You study nature, you go here, you study society, you go here, you study culture, you go here, right? So we act like these are separate worlds, but of course the world outside know, you know, doesn't know those rules. And so there are constantly hybrids forming between them. And which is why I would argue a phenomena such like climate change have proved so difficult is because we work in our disciplinary silos on one particular aspect of it. But what it really needs is an interdisciplinary understanding about how the world functions and how hybrids of natures and cultures are forming all the time. So rather than understanding the world as nature and culture, or putting those words together as nature culture. So, you know, wheat is a nature cultural story. Sugar is a nature cultural story. Image, uh, you know, cane is a nature cultural story, right? Sugar cane. So each plant, if you think about its history, it isn't what it is only by its biology, by its natural history, but through a nature cultural history. And that really opens up so much, not only about the cultural history about the plant, but the biology of it. The biology of the plant has been shaped by these um, cultural and historical processes as well. And very rarely do we ask those questions. Okay, so I want to give you two case studies to, um, you know, to um, make these arguments. And I hope you will disagree with me in the q and if you would like. So the first is talking about invasive species or biological invasion which has really um, become big in the last, I would say 20, 30 years. It really became a subfield in the 1990s. And it's a particularly, I think, curious phenomenon in the United States, given its history. Um, so in my first book, Ghost Stories for Darwin, what I was arguing there is that we think about variation, which is really the heart of evolution that genetic variation is really the, the stuff of evolution. And I was arguing that variation in biology is very much akin to difference and diversity in culture. And if you look historically, some of the key figures um, you know, within biology um, who were evolutionary biologists were really talking to that tension. And so we think of these as two complete spheres. Of, the, of nature and culture, but in fact, they have shared histories. And I use this vocabulary of haunting of ghosts because eugenics was not a benign history, right? People were sterilized, people were killed, 
genocide and extermination. Um, and so there is a lot of power to biology and the theories that we produce in its impact on the world. And that as biologists, I think it would behoove us to think about the consequences of the theories that we produce. And so this idea of in, uh, invasive species, uh, you need native species and foreign species to talk about invasive species. And the idea is about nature in place and nature out of place. So who belongs and who doesn't. And historians of um, the environment uh, and ecology argue that if you actually wanted to characterize what colonialism did, it was ecological imperialism. Right, it was about controlling uh, biological resources in the colonies, about how to extract them efficiently. Even if you take a field like conservation biology, it emerges during colonialism as colonists were trying to figure out how do we keep the supply going so we can keep extracting. So almost all of biology, one can find you know, um, roots in the histories of colonialism. And we should think about it as ecological imperialism or you know, even the modern green imperialism. Um, and this, and but if you look a little over a hundred years ago, um, a figure like David Fairchild, the USDA sent scientists across the world and said, anything interesting you see, interesting looking, economically useful, tasting, tasty, exotic looking, bring it, bring it back, right? So he himself brought something like 112,000 species into the United States. So this idea of, of you know, bordered worlds is a rather recent invention. And there was a time when suddenly what the colonists did was take plants across the world, move plants between worlds, take plants from the colonies into Kew Gardens, you know, into these uh, repositories across the world. They tried to grow a lot of those spices and herbs in other parts of the world as well. Some took, some did not. And so um, if you think about the history of the planet, you know, that original supercontinent Pangaea. Um, and so when you think about, you know, everything was in one place and then plate tectonics takes it to different parts of the world. And then you see evolutions um, in different parts of the world. Um, historians have argued that what um, colonialism did was really bring a lot of those together. Right about it's like a biological bedlam where colonists brought species from different different continents with each other, and that there was a mingling from Pangaea to the moment that we are in. And um, this whole idea that, given that history of colonialism, I want to contrast that moment of that biological bedlam with what we are doing with the discourse around invasive species today. And similarly, um, the American Acclimatization Society, where someone said, let's introduce all the species named by Shakespeare, all the birds, into central parks. Why not? <laughs> so they did. <laughs> but part of these examples I'm giving you was really a different moment, right? Of a different understanding of species and species border. When, when we did not have uh, vocabularies of native and alien, this is bad, this is good but a very different colonial moment where there was a lot of intermingling. Then of course, within the US, you see the Chinese Exclusion Act, and then you see other immigration acts that uh, locked the borders of who could come and it was no longer a free flow. What is interesting is that these laws came one year after the quarantine laws um, in the US, actually in California. So the way we think about immigration of humans closely parallel how we think about plants and animals. So it is a nature cultural world. So invasive species, according to the USDA, have to be foreign species. And this is the official um, definition. And of course, a lot of people um, link the field back to Charles Elton's um, famous book on the ecology of invasions. So I want to give you a few titles to give you a sense of how widespread this thinking is. This is a children's book about killer bees, fire ants, and other aliens are interested in America. We start very, very young um, with this you know, foreign and uh, native plants. Tinkering with Eden, this idea that there was an Eden before, and part of what invasive species have done has taken away that idyllic Eden into the world we live in today. 
the vocabulary around battles and warriors are everywhere in the invasive. We have to battle invasive species. We have to exterminate them. We have to kill them. We have been a war with non-native species. That voc vocabulary is very much um, close to us. That they are threats. Um, Um, that the aliens are among us. So I've been sort of tracking this literature over the last 20 years, and it's really striking how important a marker the 9-11 moment is and what emerges after that and before that. And this, this talk about aliens amongst us really picked up um, after 9-11. And the talk about, you know, biosecurity. Um, and so similarly, just like Homeland Security warns us all, if you see something suspicious, call us. There's, there are similar apps for plants and insects. If you see something suspicious, there are numbers you can call and report it. So you see very parallels in how we are responding to this idea of the foreign. So here are some titles from newspapers and magazines. Alien invasion, they're green, they're mean, and they may be taking over a park of preserve near you, wreaking havoc. Creepy Strangler climbs Oregon's least wanted list. Any guess on who the Creepy Strangler is? It's English, sorry? It's English ID, but Kudzu, we would say Kudzu in other parts of the world, absolutely. Um, alien threat, stemming the tide of invading species, invasive species, pathogens of globalization. What was striking to me as I was going through um, you know, a lot of such headlines, because none of them are telling you they're talking about plants or animals, right? It's this classic fear of the outsiders. Be worried about, about the outsider, be worried about the foreigner. And this I began to see repeatedly in the ways in which we were talking about plants and animals, that they were contributing to this larger climate um, of xenophobia in the country. And so as I looked at parallels between how we talked about plants um, and humans, they're unhygienic disease-ridden, they look weird, they look visibly foreign, um, taking over everything, they're slow, stealthily growing in numbers, they're indestructible. And here's the typical third world female um, trope of the oversexed female, right? They're aggressive, they're prolific reproducers, the fear of miscegenation with the native, and they're irreversible, and it, it's unlawful what they're trying to do. And um, historians who have looked at the history of xenophobia argue every time you see a big national moment of xenophobia, like the moment we're living in, you will see germ panics and fear of foreign germs or plants or animals. So we understanding xenophobia nature culturally allows us to understand this is a cross-species phenomenon. Um, my favorite uh, title was by far they came, they bred, they conquered, right? Um, um, and this is about Kudzu, of course. Yeah. Um, so post 9-11, again, just like the Homeland Security, um, here was a, you know, one from my own um, uh, university who created an app where you can take a picture and send it to your local. Um, there was citizen science mobilized across the country around invasive species, just like we do um, for humans. We have, just like we have militarized the border, there are now the green um, patriots who feel we, that, you know, we're not doing enough about climate change and we need to weaponize and militarize how we respond to climate degradation. And of course, this is so profoundly um, um, striking in a country like the US, right? Where when we talk about native, we are talking about white settler colonial. We are not talking about Native Americans. And so it really asks this question about what a Native is. 50 years, 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, right? right? How do we decide as biologists? There is no you know, um, uh, easy biological definition um, when we talk about this. And especially in this larger cultural milieu of who we are talking about Natives, we are talking about settler colonists, not um, Native Americans. So it behooves us to think deeply about what we mean by these categories of native and alien and what kind of work they're doing, both for biology and um, for the larger politics. 
by this, I'm not meaning to suggest that we are not in an ecological um, difficult, that there have, has not been ecological disruption. But the point I'm trying to make, so I would argue there's a lot of evidence within biology that if you look at the histories of development and overdevelopment of our destruction of habitats, that though that destruction is often the starting point to why invasive species often take over. There are many invasive species that have been in the country for decades, sometimes centuries, but they, they are taking off now. So the question is, what are the conditions of possibility we have created that they are in, becoming invasive now, even though they've been in the country a while away? And, um, and as biologists, the solution seems to be, at least in Boston, we had these weekend trips to the River Charles to go pull out purple loose stripe or garlic mustard. Um, and so I feel there is a fear that we create around pulling out invasive species when really the problem is much deeper about questions, about development, about land management, about trade and how we control that. And so I feel we're not getting to those proximate causes and dealing with much more superficial solutions that are unlikely to solve the problems. And that as biologists, we need to think nature culturally about how these problems came to be, how colonial short-term mentality has created particular land management strategies that have brought us where we are. I want to briefly talk about um, um, plant reproductive biology. So these are the opening lines of Amanda Schiebinger's um, Nature's Body. She says, hermaphroditic plants castrated by unnatural mothers, trees and shrubs clothed in wedding gowns, flowers spread as nuptial beds for a verdant groom and his cherished bride. Are these the memoirs of an 18th century academy of science or tales from the boudoir? And what she answers is that it's both. Um, and in fact, our vocabulary of plants comes from humans. And what she argues is that um, you will see in the history of biology that when um, the gender politics, um, the scientization of botany coincides with the sexualization of plants. And so the scientific revolution and the revolution of sexuality and gender came together. And so plant sexuality becomes the core to how Linnaeus names, um, names plants. And before that, we, there was a time when, um, you know, Western understandings of plants were about medicine and food. And with the development of the science of, of botany, it becomes this abstract and universal tool. And that was the point of much of scientific um, fields, right? Was to make them abstract and universal. So we would have the same vocabulary for scientists across the world. But in order to do that, a lot of no local knowledges were erased. And so to be a Linnaean taxonomist, Janet Brown argues, was to believe in the sex lives of plants. Not only were plants sex, but they actually became human. And so the whole idea of um, uh, Linnaean classification was based on the marriage of plants. Um, so if you think of the Nupchae plant plantarum, it is about the marriage of plants. And he literally imagined plants as um, the longer she being a quote, right? This is a marital bed and there may be two husbands, three wives, one wife, five husbands, right? Two wives, eight husbands, depending on um, what he saw as the male and female. And in fact, there are people who argue then of being pornographic because of the, the kind of vocabularies these produce. There's been much um, um, written about this for those interested. But of course, the fundamental problem is that plants are not just male and female, right? They do extraordinary things. And so in order to accommodate them, we have had to produce more and more terminology. And so we have Andricius plants, Dionysius plants, they're only male and female, Androdionysius, Gynodionysius, Androgynomonysius, Andromonysius, Gynomonysius, Polygamodionysius, Polygamomonysius, sub dioecious sub -dioecious. And this is a small set of examples, right? And so the point here is about saying that plants do such interesting things, but our whole vocabulary is about putting them in, pigeoning them into these male-female um, words and then creating a vocabulary around that. 
right? And so they had to conform to Victorian ideas of puritanical sexuality of you know, marriages and husbands and wives. And it, for me, it begs the question of what if we dump this vocabulary? Are there other ways to think about plant reproductive biology without having to think about Victorian husbands and wives? And what might that look like? One of the things to me that, um, especially since the term of the Anthropocene is catching on, the history of colonialism really begs this question of who Anthropos is, right? And when you look at the history of botany, it is not humans, some, it's some humans going to some other humans to exploit resources, right? And so I think there's something about the vocabulary of the Anthropocene that acts like, oh, we are all humans. Humans did this. When in fact, some humans, and um, I think there is enough economic evidence to suggest that colonialism was a project of underdevelopment. So the colonists developed um, Western colonial nations while underdeveloping colonized nations. That there was a transfer of wealth from the colonies um, to, to the metropole. And I think it's important for us to remember those histories at this, point, at this point when we are thinking about the Anthropocene and not to flatten humans as though we have had equivalent histories um, across the globe. Um, and so, uh, you know, the argument that these categories, sex, gender, race, um, sexuality, when we de dig deep, they are connected to um, processes, um, historical processes of colonialism, slavery, imperialism, patriarchy, misogyny, xenophobia. So this was a very short talk, but there's a lot of literature that allows us to see the connections between the terminologies we use in plant biology with these larger historical forces um, that we have lived through. So ultimately, um, in summary, um, part of what botany did was to create an abstract universal language and to erase local knowledges, right? And some of which are lost and you know, some of which um, that remain. But ultimately botany describes a world of plants without people, right? It's trying to create um, a history and an understanding and the biology of plants as though they grow in a vacuum. When in fact, if we were going to develop a different kind of perhaps more ecological historical understandings, we would produce a very different kind of botany. When we acknowledge there are humans, it is when we talk about ethno right? So that again, uh, when we talk about colonized nations and local knowledges, then we bring out the term um, ethnic. And in many ways, part of what academia did, botany is one of them, um, but part of what colonialism did was vivisect knowledge a live knowledge into these disciplinary silos. And we inhabit one of them. But part of the case I hope I'm trying to make is that there is something lost when we see the world through our disciplinary silos. And the problems that face us is something that needs interdisciplinary tools um, as well as disciplinary historical understandings. Um, and so much of botany, including the, you know, the terminology, the naming, the nomenclatures, were really uh, technologies of extraction. They were projects, um, um, solution to projects where uh, our colonists were trying to figure out how do we create the best infrastructure to be able to identify plants and extract what we need from the colonies. Um, and one of the things uh, we were talking about um, earlier is one of the things academia does so well is how we reproduce ourselves almost flawlessly generation to generation to generation. And I think one of the things we need to think about is how do we interrupt that? How do we open up the field of biology um, and botany in particular um, to, to think about the histories that bring us here? Um, and so how do we decenter Euro Eurocentric worldview, which has now become um, universal and strip so much of botanical knowledge is elsewhere in the world. And we know that that is botanical knowledge because this is what pharmaceuticals do, right? Um, so much of biopiracy, which continues on to this day, is about finding um, you know, key, and it is usually through local knowledges 
of peoples across the world that use a certain plant for X, Y, or Z. And then the companies go, they get the active ingredient. And so much of our medicines um, that we take come from the natural world and come from um, you know, local knowledges. So there is botanical knowledge extra, you know, in the world. And that these questions of biopiracy and these extractive economies continue to shape um, you know, our modern world as well as the formerly uh, colonized world. And so to me, I would like to make a case that we need to attend to these histories and ask questions of how we might decolonize botany. So I will stop there and I'm happy to take comments and questions. <laughs> Question on Zoom, if there's not one in the room right now. Sure. Yes. Um, so one of the questions is what practical steps can scientists or scientific societies make to move towards a shared, hopefully more neutral language? I think first we need to talk. I, you know, we were talking about it earlier. There is no, I, you know, it's so rare in a meeting of any sign, you know, whether it's ecology and evolution or this may happen over a year but I've never seen it in any scientific journal. I've rarely seen, seen panels or you know, talks in scientific societies that address this. There is no, to me, solutions, there aren't, um, part of what science does well is top down. And so part of decolonization has to come bottom up. It has to be a process that is talked about. I'm not here suggesting I know the answers, um, but it, is, uh, it has to be communitarian not a top-down answer. So some of it is really that departments, societies, universities have to create spaces. We need to air out openly what we think about these questions and similarly what we might do about it. So I, I basically, I don't want to reproduce the colonial language of here are the solutions because I think we need a different process when we think about decolonization. I don't have a question. This is more of a comment. I thought this was wonderful. Um, and if if may, I hadn't thought about this from the plant perspective, so thanks for for opening my eyes to that. I recently read a book called Bitch that talks about all bitch, bitch, yeah. the same set of things, but from an animal evolution perspective. I haven't read it. Is good. Interesting. Yes, I highly recommend it. Okay. Um, and it was it, talking about more from the gender perspective of you know calling an animal male or female and how that limits our ability to understand right. interactions because you place your own expectations on what it is to be a male animal or a female right. animal and what we think those interactions should look like. And so, how much of that language was built into Darwin's? Yes. Um, verbiage yeah. and then looking for examples like in in birds or other things where you expect the males are going to behave a certain way and so you only look and test those things and the things that don't happen that way you just say oh those are anomalies that's not really how but when you go back and, and reevaluate it sort of with with a, a less biased lens yeah. um then you'll see the this massive amount of diversity so the slide that you had all the possible yeah polygamy and male is you know whatever that yeah, all of yeah. these terms that they were talking about how well, that's the same in the animal world. There's a huge spectrum of diversity, but we just ignore it because we find what we expect to find because that's what we look for. So anyway, I thought this and this is something that genetics has really helped with because mm -hmm. we created so many stories of this is the alpha male, and you know, but when they went and did genetic studies of the progeny, right? Something else emerged. Thank you for that. Interesting. I think one of the things that struck me when we're talking about the language from um, kind of the species, is specifically as very polarizing. I'm wondering how do we deal with things like the destructing ecosystem problems and such uh, with avoiding that language? Like, I, I just I'm sorry. I don't know how to deal with that. Yeah. So, there, you know, several biologists have other proposals. So, for example, Mark Davis at McAllister, one of the suggestions is let's Talk about the life history of plants, not the geography of plants. Let's look at what they do. Um, and so they have a set of eight life history characters that they suggest. And it's only a small subset of that can, that can potentially become invasive. 
So rather than say we need to destroy all foreign species because they may one day become invasive, which some um, do claim, we can focus on a subset, right? And then when you focus on life history characteristics, you're talking about what ecosystems sustain, right? Or what is this ecosystem in which something might, might become invasive? So if we move back to the biology of plants, rather than these litmus tests on geography, um, that might be an opening to move away from um, talking about good plan, bad plan, good country, bad country, and moving to what I would argue is most important. Yeah, yeah, I, I just like more of a, you know, like um, thinking more about it, like we humans, I do think we have like a tendency to anthropomorphize yeah. everything, like even like, you know, with the COVID pandemic, with the viruses and everything, yeah. like the virus is not just a, right. Like, yeah, so I was just Very thinking true. about that. Yeah. We have another question on Zoom. What are the bases of botanical nomenclature developed by other cultures? Do non-Euro cultures avoid animal comparisons um, like genitalia? Um, if so, what type of language is used? Okay, that's a huge question, and I'm not an expert on all indigenous cultures in the world. So I think, and I don't think there is one answer to that. Um, so I think there's a lot of variation. Right, but we know so little about it, and certainly within botany and zoology departments, we rarely talk about this. So I, I would suggest that you know that we we could we could all start an education in thinking about other kinds of vocabularies. Certainly in the Indian con context that I grew up with, a lot of the plant names I knew were very descriptive of the ways in which that plant. Um, was entangled in our lives, you know, the claim of the forest, which the, or, you know, the orange plants would take over, um, or the Ashoka tree because it's connected to um, a particular king in the history of India. So they're very connected to, um, to cultures, to particular historical moments, because they're living, they're living creatures entangled in human lives. And to me, part of what um, Botany does in its Latin names is it divorces you from that and it makes botany an alien language we need to come and learn. And so at this moment when we are talking so much about you know kids not being connected to nature, I think we would go a long way in opening up multiple languages. After all in the world we have many languages. So why can't we also be open to multiple languages within botany? And with a digital archive, it shouldn't be that that difficult for us to, you know, create a library where these names, we could figure out what the, you know, alternative words. So botanists can do what they want to do, but it also opens up cultures of plant love, of plant lovers, you know, outside. Yeah. So really good thinking about this idea that you thinks about, you know, the way that we put husbands and wives and we made them at the time, right? And I've seen the opposite recently be true as well, where, you know, there are human experiences that we look for examples of in nature. Like, yeah. look, there are gay monkeys, yes. clownfish are trans, you know, yes, yes. that makes our behavior yeah. experience as human valid. And that appeal to nature almost feels like a fallacy to me. Yes. Because um, we shouldn't have to credential valid human experiences by finding examples in nature. And so I just wonder how we have those conversations between what is okay to be as humans, as plants, without you know needing to be deferent to one experience as the valid one. Hundred percent agree. Um, but on the other hand, I think that part part of what um, but uh, plants and animal worlds can be inspiring. They can inspire us to think differently. I think there's a lot that happens in human worlds, the way if you, for example, talk in queer communities. Um, there are a lot of uh, interesting affiliations, vocabularies that develop that never make it to the mainstream. So I, I think that, um, so to me, the challenge in this work for me has been, on the one hand, you have human exceptionalism, where we think nothing is like us and that's a problem and anthropomorphism, where we put our world onto the other. But to me, experiments in the reverse are useful. 
you know, what if we think from the point of view of bacteria or um, barnacles, you know, which uh, Charles Darwin studied um, that have, you know, many different formations um, might be a way to inspire us to think anew. Um, but I think we, this idea that one is right, one is wrong, um, seems an unproductive place for me, right? So the, to allow the, these comparisons and ideas, even while we are constantly aware of human exceptionalism and anthropomorphism, might be a productive space. Because I think, um, you know, very often when I talk to um, biologists, it's like an impossibility to imagine otherwise. <laughs> How else would we talk about this? And so in that sense, to me, just going to the biological literature to look at what other uh, plants and animals do is an interesting starting point, right? And then to take those labels out and to sit with the biology and to see what might emerge. And that maybe we would organize it differently, you know, maybe not around this. To what extent is, um, you know, so we put the production so centrally um, within animals, right, with the whole uh, field of um, sexual selection. And we have imported that sexual selection and the cent uh, centrality of an isogamy into plant worlds as well, right? So technically in biology, when you think of male and female, these are um, descriptions about gamete sites. Uh, individuals that produce the uh, large gamete is female, the individual that produce a small gamete is male. But how much we, you know, but what we do with it is so much more. So I think if we get more precise in our definitions and take some of this mythology and storytelling away, I think we might become better biologists and produce more accurate descriptions of the world. Great. Sai, thank you so much. Thank you for the talk.